Mathematicians have used symbolic notations since the subject first began. You see them on Babylonian tablets, the Rhind Papyrus, on the pages of Libra Abaci, the manuscript that brought modern arithmetic to Western Europe in the 13th century, and in modern math textbooks like the one shown, written by me in 2012. Yet most of the mathematics we perform every day, usually referred to as everyday math, takes place mostly in our minds. Everyday math is primarily a way of thinking. So where do the symbols come in? This scene from the 1997 hit movie Good Will Hunting, starring Matt Damon and Robin Williams, shows a mathematician doing math. But where is that doing actually taking place? In Will Hunting's mind? Or on the board? Or is it a mixture of both? More generally, is math something you see on a page or something you do in your head? Well, let me ask a seemingly different question. Is this music? Or is music what you find in the action on the right? In this case, we have no doubt. Our ears provide the answer. Music is what the pianist creates and the audience hears. On the right you have music, an activity. On the left, a static score. An activity and a representation. Now let's go back to my previous question. Where's the math? The answer's the same. What you see on a page is a representation of mathematics. The math itself takes place inside the head. To make the distinction clear, I generally use the term mathematical thinking to refer to the mental act of doing math, and use the word mathematics in a looser, more generic way. From that perspective, those symbols on a page are a user interface to mathematics. I want you to keep in mind this distinction between mathematical thinking, which takes place in your head, and mathematical representations, which you see on pages in a book. It's at the heart of everything I'm going to show you. That symbolic representation is extremely powerful for doing mathematics, which is what it was developed for. But it sucks big time for beginners learning math. It provides a barrier to learning, what I refer to as the symbol barrier. That's my term, but I introduced it only after I read the first of what were many studies showing just how much of a barrier to learning it is. In that first study, carried out in the early 1990s in street markets in Brazil, researchers posed as shoppers as they observed and recorded schoolchildren looking after their parents' market stalls. They found that the children had developed sophisticated and efficient mental strategies for handling cash sales, and did so with an effectively perfect accuracy rate of 98%. Yet when the researchers subsequently gave the children a paper and pencil test with the very same arithmetic problems that the researchers had presented to them at the market stall, their accuracy rate dropped to 37%. The mathematics was the same. The problem was a symbolic representation. It wasn't a math issue, it was a linguistic one. The interface that was developed to do math is a poor one for a beginner learning math. So why do we use symbols to teach math? It turns out that using symbols to teach math is a consequence of a powerful technology that became available in the 15th century. The printing press. Prior to the printing press, mathematics texts were written mostly in words, with the only symbols being numerals. The reason why mathematicians before the printing press wrote their books in prose was that handwritten books were duplicated by scribes, often monks in monasteries, most of whom were not familiar with mathematics and therefore could not be relied on to accurately reproduce symbolic expressions. But with the printing press that problem went away. Mathematicians were one of the first groups to send manuscripts to printers, and ever since Mathematics has been taught using books with symbolic expressions. Here's an example from the very first algebra textbook, 
written by the Persian mathematician al khwarizmi in 9th century Baghdad. If you were a math student back then, this is the kind of problem you'd be asked to solve, and the way you would write the answer. Do you have any idea what kind of a problem it is? Let me show you how the same problem was written and solved after the printing press allowed books to use symbols. It's a simple quadratic equation. Though you need to master the symbolic language of algebra to do it this way, once you do, the process becomes much simpler. Math is simply much easier to do using symbols. The symbols were banished purely in order to write textbooks that could be accurately duplicated by hand. The printing press changed all that. But that technologically driven change in representation came at a price for learners, the symbol barrier. Well, today we have a new technology. The digital tablet, or even a regular computer screen, is paper on steroids. Are there alternative ways we can represent mathematics using this new technology that allow us to break the symbol barrier and remove a known obstacle to learning? Take a look at this problem. It looks hard. But is it hard because of the thinking required to understand it and solve it? Or does the difficulty lie in the symbolic representation? Well, here's the same problem represented differently on a tablet. It's an app I developed, and I'll talk about it in a minute. In both cases, the problem comes in three parts. The first part asks you to solve something. The other two parts ask you to solve it more efficiently. You'll see some other commonalities as well. The 4 and the 7, for instance. But whereas we usually think of the problem on the right as college-level algebra, the one on the left has been solved by hundreds of thousands of kids as young as eight all over the world. And when they solve it, they perform the same steps as you would use if you did it using the symbolic algebra on the right. The only difference is the representation. The representation on the left is just more efficient for representing and solving this kind of problem. This is the printing press revolution all over again. A new technology has provided us with ways to represent mathematics that are more effective for beginners learning math. The earlier technology made math learning symbolic at the cost of the symbol barrier. Today's new technology enables us to break the symbol barrier. I'll come back to where that leaves symbols in a minute. They're not going to go away. But first let me respond to one remark you are probably bursting to make. Isn't that alternative representation just a child's game? A toy? Yes it is. So too is this. At least, that's how we view it today. But the abacus is one of humankind's most powerful inventions. It democratised arithmetic, making it possible for ordinary people all over the world to handle numbers in trade and commerce and government. As a result, what we now see as a toy quite literally changed the world. In theory, we all know how to use an abacus, though few of us today are skilled at it. Let me show you how to use my app to solve systems of linear equations, or perhaps I should say linear relationships, in up to four unknowns. You operate the device, this one has two unknowns, by rotating any of the small cogs a certain number of times to turn the large wheel. The number of cogs the wheel turns depends on the number of teeth on the small cog. The goal is to collect the keys and the other items on the wheel by bringing them under the zero marker at the top of the wheel. Let's see some young kids use this device. OK, here we go. Starts the game, rotates the small cog to turn the big wheel, tries to collect the keys and the objects. On this particular puzzle you can rotate each small cog up to five times. Collected the key, solved the puzzle, got a trophy. Now let's watch this young girl, being helped by her father, complete the solution of this more difficult puzzle with three cogs. Yeah. 
best. There we are, she collects the third key, solves the puzzle, and gets congratulated by her dad. Wonderful. Just as the abacus changed the way people did math, so too apps like these can change the way people learn maths. Well, perhaps not the abacus anymore. It operates at too low a level for today's world. These are all apps that provide alternative representations of mathematics, making use of the dynamic, interactive properties of the tablet or the computer screen to break the symbol barrier. In fact, at present, these are almost the only math learning apps designed to provide alternative representations of mathematics. The other 25,000 or so math learning apps available on the App Store alone all rely on the traditional symbolic representation, which is a bit like producing printed math textbooks in the 15th century that were all prose, which didn't happen. But isn't it important for kids to master the symbols, you might ask? Well, for kids who are not going into STEM or perhaps the financial world, it's much more important that they master basic, everyday mathematical thinking. And apps like these have been shown to develop that ability, and to do so much more quickly as a result of bypassing the symbol barrier. But that aside, it simply makes sense to separate the two processes of learning how to think mathematically and mastering the symbolic representation. Once a child has learned how to solve linear equations, maybe I should call them linear relationships, using my app, they can then learn the symbolic way to do it. In fact, we can provide them with a version of our app that helps them make that transition. With this app, when you solve the puzzle using the gear mechanism on the right, the symbolic equation solution is displayed on the left. Alternatively, you can enter the symbolic equations on the left and the gears on the right move to solve the problem. Let me show you one other app that breaks a symbol barrier and then helps the players make the transition to the symbolic representation after they've mastered the mathematical thinking. It's called Dragon Box and it focuses on solving linear equations in one unknown. It comes from a small startup in Norway. The two sides of the equation are shown as two halves of a rectangle, like the two sides of a tennis court. The unknown is a box surrounded by a sparkling halo. The goal is to isolate the box on one side of the court with everything else on the other side. That releases a small dragon and solving further problems feeds the dragon so it grows bigger. The player manipulates the various items according to rules that are analogues of the ancient rules for solving equations going back to al Khwarizmi, with the stipulation that whatever you do to one side, you have to do to the other. Here goes. At first, the objects the kids manipulate are typical looking game objects. No mathematical symbols. Negation is turning over, which swaps colours. Then the picture objects are gradually replaced by algebraic symbols, but the player's actions remain the same, and there's an equal sign across the central divide. Then, finally, the tennis court background disappears, and it looks like traditional algebra on paper, though the player is still moving objects the same way. And she solved it! Well done! There's research to back up this alternative representation approach. A major study of many thousands of kids run by the University of Washington in Seattle, in Washington State, Minnesota and Norway in 2013-14 showed that kids mastered the solution of linear equations in one unknown in an hour and a half. In a game context, that is. At the end, they've mastered the algebraic thinking and they are familiar with the symbols but some work is still required to become fluent in the symbolic language. That study wasn't set up to evaluate the learning efficacy of Dragon Box, so the results weren't published as a scientific paper. But the size of the study population gave the measured outcomes considerable weight. My own game, Was It Trouble, 
was subjected to a rigorous scientific study by researchers at Stanford. I wasn't involved, by the way, due to conflict of interest considerations. The Stanford team found evidence of significant improvement in number sense and overall problem solving after just two hours of play spread over a month, relative to a comparison group. The results were published in a leading peer-reviewed journal in 2015. That big improvement after just 120 minutes play was so surprising that I contacted a colleague in Finland working on game-based learning and asked him if he would conduct a similar study of the app. He did so with a twist. Instead of just using a written pre- and post-test to measure improvement, he also used a fractions learning game he'd developed called Semideus, as an additional pre- and post-test. The results were almost identical to those from the Stanford study. The finished results were published in the same journal as the Stanford study. So there's good reason to believe we've seen the future of beginning math education, where we are finally able to separate out the task of learning the mathematical thinking that goes on in our minds from mastery of the symbolic language that goes on the page. We can, at last, break the symbol barrier that prevents good learning. And if you want to find out more, here's a book I wrote on the subject and links to my various coordinates. Thank you for watching.